Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy. I just want to thank everybody uh, for the continued support of Suzy's State of Consumer webinar series. Uh, this is now, I believe, our 25th or 26th edition of the State of the Consumer webinar edition, dating all the way back to early March 2020. And here we are in mid-July 2021, and we're finally putting titles of our webinars together that have the word back to normal instead of new normal. So hopefully that is a sign of hope. Although every single time we think that we've escaped this pandemic, we get another scary headline. Um, but that's a whole nother story. So we just have to remain hopeful. Um, I am uh, broadcasting live from Southampton, New York. Uh, we are still remote as a company um, at Suzy, although we have started to bring people back together. We're going to be talking a lot today um, with our guest, Colin Galpine, who will introduce in a second, about just what it means to have an office and and bring people together both for work and for school so um again just want to thank everyone for coming today and we're gonna have a great presentation uh for the next hour so with that i would like to introduce my special guest uh today colin mcalpine colin thanks so much for joining you are um coming in live from palo alto is that correct that's correct right in the heart of the bay area and how is the bay area right now uh, as many of my friends and colleagues are lamenting, the traffic is picking back up. We had okay. about a year where it was possible to get to San Francisco or San Jose uh, somewhat easily, but I would say it's getting back to normal. I went for a walk last night and people are out, they're mingling, they're in their backyard. So I, I think the, whatever it is, the new normal or the, the return to normal is, is finally here for, for most people. And how about San Francisco? Because that's where you see a lot of negative headlines with crime, yeah. and, you know, the uneasiness of people living there. Uh, are you seeing that when you go to back, back to San Francisco? And that's where your headquarters are. Yes, we're headquartered in San Francisco. We're fully remote, but I go up there quite a bit to meet with my CEO and to meet with colleagues. San Francisco is a tough place. Um, I don't have the best assessment of it because I don't live there. But whenever I go, it, it looks worse, frankly. And right. I speak to people... I speak to people all day, every day, who are making the decision where to put their company, where to put their work hubs in their offices, and a lot of people are trying to escape. Uh, yeah. I hear that constantly. So, and I, I'm not comparing San Francisco to New York. I think San Francisco is in a unique problem, or is facing a unique set of problems, or at least grander than a lot of the other cities on the West Coast. Right. At the same time, San Francisco is in California, which is one of the most beautiful areas of the world. So right. it has so much going for it. But you know, you think throughout time, and there was a time when the hub of America was in Detroit, right? And, and, and things change over time. Um, not everything remains constant. And obviously, every city we, we hope recovers as best possible. But I would agree that San Francisco has a unique set of challenges, but it's a beautiful city and there's so much history there. And, you know, you have Stanford and, yep. and theater of so much talent that, you know, we hope it does come back. And, and while we have you um, talking about, you know, yourself and where you live, et cetera, tell us about Cody for those who don't know what Cody is and what Cody does. Absolutely. Uh, so Cody and um, actually Susie partnered not too long ago. We, we provide work hubs flexibly wherever you need them. And uh, just to give you the like the one sentence description is our, our early investors called us WeWork meets Airbnb, which is an app description. We try to provide the consistency of beautiful work hubs and office settings with the flexibility of hyper locality. So what that means is that we have both residential and commercial spaces on the platform. In a place like New York City, it's going to be probably more commercial spots. Um, sure. But now people are truly working everywhere. And so the need for a system that can provide office space everywhere and kind of seamlessly is important. Yeah, our team has really enjoyed working with the Cody team. And you guys did a great job helping us build out some really cool spaces, which allowed our teams to get together uh, throughout this. So we're really appreciative of it. Yeah. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Um, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, um, or it's your first time on a state of consumer webinar, Suzy is a real-time market research software platform that works with large enterprise uh, companies that enable direct-to-consumer market research. So it essentially allows you to make every decision with the voice of the consumer front and center. And as this world continues to change, um, it's never been more important that you embrace consumer centricity as a company, and that's what Suzy is here to do. And all the research that we are discussing, the first party research comes from Suzy's platform. Um, the research we are discussing today uh, was based on a Suzy study conducted from June 27th to 30th with a sample size of 1,000 Americans and the sample size directory representative of US consumers working from home and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that, let's jump right in. Um, September 2021, is the unofficial start of the post-COVID era for so many reasons. Uh, many believe that, you know, 
we were waiting for this new back to school season to kind of come back and really attempt things um, in the way they were in 2019. Uh, you know, in many markets around America, and we're not speaking on a global basis because there's so many other countries that are so far behind in their vaccination rates, but in many major metros around America, the vaccination rates are at a level which a lot of epidemiologists believe that we can start to return back normal. And we really start to see that before the summer. I, you know, I think of Madison Square Garden during the NBA playoffs, this kind of epic moment in May where Madison Square Garden was full of people, sold out arena, and you're sitting on TV with, without people wearing masks. That was a vision that many of us thought was impossible just six months prior. So now, as we head in the fall, post-summer, post-people sort of spreading out and continuing to work remotely, you have many offices that are saying that Labor Day is um, kind of the, the D-Day, so to speak, of when they're going to draw the line. Um, and some companies, again, have, have seen this pandemic as a way to really reinvent themselves and reinvent their companies. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about uh, today. Um, it is sort of a tale of kind of two opinions, though, because while on a, um, you know, a federal or, or nationwide level, we are talking about bringing people back um, to school. We do have, um, you know, some markets that are still saying like California, um, people are still going to be wearing masks. So we really don't know um, how this is going to play out. We have the new Delta variant um, that is arriving right now, right now. Uh, kids that are 12 and younger still are not able to get vaccinated and many people um, are still concerned about that. So it's not necessarily like a light switch flipping on um, with COVID. There's still a lot of unknowns, unfortunately, about this, but many people are hopeful. Um, you know, you could see here a survey of over 60% of uh, Manhattan officers return in September. That's a massive jump. I mean, just this past spring, I was in Midtown Manhattan and it was still very empty um, because the only thing that's really in some of these neighborhoods in Midtown Manhattan is offices. And none of the offices um, really have more than 5% capacity. So it looked completely empty. There was not much traffic, et cetera. So to think that 60% of Manhattan office workers were here in September, and if that's something that's going to be echoed throughout major cities across America, that's a sea change. Another area I really start to, started to see some massive changes heading into the summer was with uh, consumer retail. Um, I was in the Soho area of Manhattan, and the lines were outside the door for many retailers. It was a mob scene, um, you know, in, in, in highly um, kind of dense retail areas. So you could start to see some of these habits really coming back um, with quite ferocity um, as really consumers look at this as an opportunity to kind of embrace the way that things were. So really the question we're gonna answer today, Colin and I, is will things return to the way they were pre-COVID in the next two months? Um, it's unlikely um, from many um, individual opinions that it's going to be exactly like it was because so many people have gotten comfortable with the notion of working from home. So many people have moved and they've changed their lifestyles. So many companies have uh, grown accustomed to the cost savings and efficiencies with deploying a remote workforce that to think that we're going to go back to a 2019 state is unlikely. And really one of the things we want to try to uncover today is, well, where is that? Where are we going to fall along the spectrum from let's just call it a 2019 world to a 2020 world? Uh, the fall of 2021 is going to start to answer that question, right? In terms of where it's going to be. Colin, generally speaking, what is the world going to look like in September? Is it going to look more like 2019 or more like 2020? I think it's going to have to be a hybrid of those two yeah. years, right? Um, that's not really an answer. Come on. I know, but that, I think <laughs> that's the right one. Um, and it will depend on the company. Yeah. One thing that I think is absolutely accurate is that that people will expect different things from their companies. Um, yeah. they, and depending maybe on which industry, and I think there will be some interesting parallels later in this with like banking versus, you know, more traditional industries versus more modern industries like tech, there will be different expectations. And it will even go down to the expectations for individuals within different teams, like what does HR versus sales versus marketing look like? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. Like we think that, but then when I think about just major forms of society and societal norms, normally there things do veer to a black or white in terms of just the protocol mm -hmm. on what you do. And whenever there seems to be sort of room for interpretation, sometimes you open up, so, like even at a corporate level, just sort of a, the, the kind of sliver of chaos that can kind of right. go in because it, you know, what happens if some people come in some days, some don't others, the people who right. are there don't feel it's fair from the people who don't and vice versa. Those are sort of some of the things that we really want to figure out because we are at an impasse. And in some ways the employer and the employee are at odds in terms of what they want. In right. other 
in other companies, uh, not so much. And, you know, we, we call it a, a work quake, for lack of a better term, where you are starting to see this divide um, coming back into the fall. I can tell you at Suzy, overwhelmingly, our employees are really dying to come back in to the office. They, yeah. We do have a younger team overall. Um, and my experience is most younger people who live in cities, they want to come back in the office or maybe folks who have moved out to the suburbs and have kids, you mm -hmm. know, want to spend more time with their family, less time commuting, et cetera. That's been my experience, but I know it's not binary. Yeah. And, and I yeah. know many people that are home with kids or if they can, or can't wait to leave the house. So I yeah. think, you know, um, we ask consumers, um, that work be home for work from home if they expect to do so in the future. And 62% of respondents said um, that they actually, if those who worked at home during a pandemic actually expect to do so in the future to at least some degree. So there's not many people that, that think that it's going to be sort of, again, a light switch turning off and, you know, they're not going to be able to go on zoom ever again. Uh, overwhelmingly people expect to be able to do that again. Um, and a lot of, employees are kind of speaking with their feet, so to speak. Um, some companies that have said, we're going back in, in the fall, they're saying, you know what, not me. Um, and 4 million people, which is nearly 3% of the US workforce, quit their jobs in April. And that's a record since uh, going back to 2000. And what scares me kind of is whenever you see something going back to 2000, well, 2000 is when the dot com bubble burst, right? And, and there was inflation and so much capital that the employees felt like they had such an upper hand that they could just leave in droves. Um, and I think that ultimately a, a good functioning economy and society is when the kind of the power balance between employees and employer are, are kind of kind of even, so to speak. Right. And now if, if consumers are saying, you know, we can leave, the unemployment benefits are such that we can go, that to me is a bubbly signal to yeah. me. But then again, it also is good that consumers are showing that they have power um, and yeah. employees are showing that they have power. Um, does that surprise you that that many people are leaving work basically in some ways to protest any change back to a 2019 state? It, it doesn't surprise me right now. What I'm most curious to see is because we, we see like irrational amounts of capital right now like all of the q2 numbers from vc show how much you know cash is being in, yep. injected in these companies like higher than ever um and we're eclipsing like year-long run rates in a single quarter so i think that great resignation is partially due to of course yeah companies are hiring uh completely remotely now or they did over the pandemic and will continue it the economy is good for the people that are moving around these are yep. mostly knowledge workers i'm guessing information workers absolutely but yeah. there's also just so much cash in the market and if that dries up I worry that it's going to shift completely back to the employer power dynamic where I agree with you. It's an employee's market right now, but I think it's uh it could be dangerous to kind of up, you know, upsee your entire life based on these, these jobs that was, especially with like small startups that are getting so much money. Um, I'm thinking the very much smaller ones that some of the ones that I work with. Yeah. And I think across all phases of kind of the worker spectrum, you're seeing kind of this pushback from employees. I mean, you see oh, yeah. everywhere, you know, outside quick service restaurants and convenience stores help want it. Um, you know, right. I think that many, you have these companies where they're paying the CEO tens and tens of millions of dollars and they're not moving the minimum wage of their workers. And, you know, with the, with the subsidies that have come in from the government, why would they work? And if companies want to bring people back to work, they should pay people enough that they don't have to work three jobs in order to support their family. So that could be a good thing coming out of this is mm -hmm. that, you know, people are, are more fairly paid um, because inflation is a real thing. And, and I think that companies definitely need to follow suit. So like, yeah. you know, what is driving a great resignation? I think we've already touched upon for a bit, but you know, people got a taste of freedom and they're looking for a work-life balance. When you, once you get that freedom, it's hard to say, you know what, I really want to go back to this five day work week uh, because what, right. you know, what, a, what the pandemic also showed us is that you can't take anything for granted. You know, we, we saw millions of people die and, you know, it probably makes people take a step back and really rethink what's important in their lives and having yeah. that work life balance is definitely a big part of it. So, um, you know, we at, having that freedom is sort of like what, kind of peel back a layer of that what does freedom look like and we asked consumers you know nearly have said flexible schedules people said spending time with their friends and family cooking at home these are all things that people really enjoy doing um yeah. as part of the pandemic um you know one thing when a one big kind of topic that i've faced as, as a ceo of a startup and i think so many parents face really every single day is you know, what does home care look like? 
coming out of this? Um, how do um, women who have children uh, going to make sure how we're going to make sure as a country that we're giving them the benefits and the things they need? Because many people who were um, impacted by the workforce are people or women who had to take care of their children and didn't have um, the opportunity to have child care and then lost their jobs. How are we going to make sure that we support them coming back into it? So we have to look at different constituencies that have different sort of priorities and responsibilities when we think about bringing um, people back to work. Um, over 50 percent of people are more comfortable talking to their boss about work life balance. So this is the good thing. You know, this whole sort of hustle culture that had come out where you have to work 15 hours a day. And if you actually try to talk to your your boss at work and tell them that you need more time is a negative thing or a sign of weakness. I think one good thing coming out of this is that it is making people more comfortable. And I think many employers um, are aware of this. Um, I, I'm curious to think about your thoughts on this column, but uh, yeah. Kickstarter is moving to a four day work week. Um, you know, we're seeing many European countries sort of adopting this already. What are your thoughts on four day work week? And do you think this is something that could kind of really stick? I, I'm mixed on this. I'm speaking to John Lalonde at Kickstarter about this specifically. I reached out okay. to him. We, we work with them and I, I was fascinated. I've heard about the studies out of Japan, out of New Zealand, about the success of it without impacting productivity. But I'm not convinced it will work, uh, especially for companies pr probably in our stage, Matt, where it is really all hands on deck. When you're building a company, yeah. uh, you're in some pretty important stages. And so... I have mixed feelings. I would like to try it personally, but right. my concern is that that four day work week will turn into work four days officially. And then everyone kind of works on Friday morning and then is working maybe longer hours. So I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I, for, I me, it. for me, it's all about the operating model of a business and yeah. what a company can pay an employee to get a proper return on that investment to essentially deliver shareholder return. You know, as a CEO, my number one goal is delivering shareholder return from a business standpoint. Obviously, right. we want to create an impact and, and create a great place for our employees to work, et cetera. But in terms of how I'm evaluated, I need to build shareholder value. And one way yeah. you do that is deploying your capital the way that drives that shareholder value. And human capital is one of our biggest investments. That being said... I can't say for sure that, you know, a, a, an engineer or a salesperson or a customer success rep working four days out of five days a week makes them less productive. They can manage their time the right way and they're right. focused on the right things. And we're giving them the tools and knowledge where they can be more effective. So I think a lot of it is based upon the output, not the input. And if the output is where you need it to be, you know, it could be three days. But like, yeah. you know, in some instances, seven days isn't enough. The person right. is productive. So I think it's really dependent upon your operating model. Do you have an inclination to which teams would best work in a shortened work week or have you thought that through? No, I mean, I, we know that for, in terms of like a virtual environment, our engineering team is often work remotely. Um, so I think that that for, for them, it was sort of like the easiest transition um, during COVID in terms mm -hmm. of taking off Friday. Like I would assume that people who deal with customers, it's probably hardest because yep. if a customer has a need on a Friday, you we yep. can't just say, sorry, we're, we're not coming back until Monday. Right. So I think, you know, you know, we're such a customer driven, customer um, um, focused organization that that would probably be, I would think, the most challenging role uh, yeah. to kind of implement a four day work week. So um, uh, theory two: the pandemic gave people time to reflect and reevaluate their career, career paths. Um, 40 percent of dissatisfied workers looking to switch a job to a better company culture. I think culture is so important. We were talking before this call and how I think culture is a secret weapon for a company and, and it can really be what drives productivity and drives employee retention, drives innovation, et cetera. Um, so people want to, you know, join, I think a lot of smart companies are figuring ways to reach people in new ways because the, the you know, with this growing economy, um, you know, a lot of people are trying to hire us included. We have dozens and dozens of open roles right now at Suzy and some companies are really uh, exploring innovative new ways to hire, including using platforms like TikTok um, and, and something like called TikTok resumes to help find your new job. So using new mediums to reach a new type of worker and showcase your culture and try to you know be innovative in, in recruiting because it's very hard, I can tell you as an employer right now, finding the right level of talent, especially in specialized uh, right. skill, skill sets. Um, you know, it's funny. How are people committing to investing uh, and to new career paths? Um, it's, I, I think stronger Wi-Fi is so funny, but it's just so important. It's just kind of these little things that 
companies need to reinforce the, to create better worker environments, snacks, additional space. Um, we are, as we were talking about, looking at office space um, options right now moving forward. And there's so many things that you want to weigh when you're, when you're building a new office environment in, in a 2021 world. One of which is how do you make your conference rooms hybrid where people who are may, might be on Zoom feel like that they have a good vantage point where they can see everyone. Their, their audio and video works. Like if you're going to tell people it's virtual, you don't want to disenfranchise them by right. not having them be there um, as much as possible. Not there in the physical sense, but there in terms of their presence. So those right. are all things I think you need to figure out when you're thinking about um, office space. Um, so it's really innovative for what people want and what people need, I think is a big brand opportunity coming out of this because I think now as the employer, as the consumer has choice, you sort of need to rethink what you prioritize. Um, it's not always just, a, again, just about what's best for the company, but it's what's best for the employee. You, you in some ways need to make it alluring if you want them to come into an office. You can't have, you know, an office, like the movie Office Space style, style cubicles where you expect them to actually want to spend their time in a, um, you know, dark, uh, you know, a very, um, you know, static environment. You need to make it fun and you need right. to make it collaborative. Um, this was, I thought was interesting sort of as companies understanding that. Um, this is a conceptual wall router. This is a, basically a Wi-Fi router that people are saying, you know what, if, if, if offices are going to reinforce design and culture and individuals and people are going to want to build out their home office, then things in the past that we might not have thought about, like the design of a router, now all of a sudden might matter. So this is sort of all these big discussions sort of trickling down to the design of a wall router. And you can see how some of these things are so very important. Um, yeah right now. And as we spoke about earlier, jobs right now are plenty. People have so many options. Right now, there are over 9 million job openings in the United States. Um, so there's so many companies that are hiring right now. Um, as you mentioned, there is so much capital out there that it really is such a competitive hiring market and companies need to think about um, so many different things to really differentiate uh, themselves. Um, and a lot of employers are throwing uh, money at the, at the problem. Um, you know, Companies that are sort of again, if it's a if it's an employee's market versus an employer's market, um, then employees can really dictate a lot. Um, and in that regard, forty percent of of employees said flexibility to work from home is the policy that's going to best affect how they pick their next job. I was talking to a potential candidate yesterday who is incredibly talented. And she told me that she was offered a promotion and she lives on the West Coast, but they would only give her the promotion if she moved back to New York. And and she said, you know what? I don't think I want to do it. Tell me about opportunities at Suzy. And ultimately, that's going to be a huge mistake that that company did because they, you know, ultimately great people will be successful no matter where they are, especially with all the right. tools. Does that surprise you, Colin, that the company would yeah. do that? That that makes, I mean, the, the previous company, I mean, I don't know what the company's style is. If it's, if right. it's Apple, it wouldn't surprise me. If it's JP Morgan, wouldn't surprise me. But for the companies really trying to secure top talent, like I think they're going to have to open up their locations more without creating a two-tiered system. Because if you have a core group of employees going into an HQ somewhere and then a bunch of others that are kind of seen as, we say, like second-tier citizen or like a, an inequitable situation, then that will create cultural schisms, if you will. Absolutely. And the So I agree. Like everyone wants flexibility. No one wants to commute again unless you have like a beautiful 15-minute walk down some street in New York City. But no one really wants to commute. So how can, how can companies that are like partially remote, partially in person provide that? It's tough. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so one question, is there any upsides to office life? I yeah. think there's many. Um, yeah. I've built my career in building companies where people have built long lasting lifetime relationships with one another. I mean, I've seen so many employees end up getting married and having, starting a family together. Right. Um, but most importantly, the relationships and the learning and the experience, I think, is really what molds you, especially as sort of a younger professional. Um, your ability to be exposed to people who have been there and done that and learn from them, I think it's something that you can't do in a Zoom environment, the serendipity. I believe there's so many upsides to office life that for me, personally, it was never a question of having an office again. Um, to me, we sort of like draining out the soul of our business if we didn't have a place um, anymore. Um, so, you know, the, the upsides to individuals is obviously domestic distractions, loneliness, uh, and a more sedentary lifestyle. You know, Colin, we were talking about this prior. I think the one thing that so many people instantly forget is that, yes, in 2020, people were productive working from home because they had nowhere else to go and nothing else to do. And they were stuck at home. And if you're stuck at home, you might as well kill it at work. 
But right. in 2021, in September, when you can go out late at night the night before, or you can go out to Starbucks, or you can go for a walk in the park, or a million different things, you're going to have so many different options. And if you're at home, you may not want to be as productive at work. And then you might not be as productive at work. And that might impact your career trajectory. So I think it's one thing that a lot of people, when, and also your kids aren't going to be at home anymore. They're going to be at school and people are going to, you know, people are going to be doing their own thing. So I think the notion that we're going to be just as productive moving forward than we were during the pandemic working at home, you're, you're taking away the biggest variable, um, which is the pandemic. Yeah. So I don't know if you had thoughts on that, Colin, in terms of the people sort of not maybe forgetting that major fact. I agree with all that. I, I think the people who will be truly successful with working from home are the ones who can not only create a focused environment, but then focus themselves. A lot of people talk about not being able to focus when they're just alone all day. Yeah. They, they go out and they search for coffee shops. They search for opportunities to either have the background noise or the direct interaction. So you might see that certain people are drawn to remote work and then others simply can't stand it. We see that all the time. Our, our data suggests that we, so we did this report called uh, the state of the workplace and we released it in January based on about 470 odd companies we spoke to. And we took data points from each of them on what they're seeing with their employees. So really that was 470 companies are probably thousands of data points right. because they pulled them from their, their teams and 90% of people are distracted at home. So yeah. how could you just combine all those data? And everyone is like struggling with some aspect, whether you have kids, you have, you have dogs, you live in a 400 square foot apartment in New York city, whatever it is, it's, it's tough to be there. So I, I do agree. People need outlets. Yep. I also just think about how many things in an office I overheard or the people I ran into or the, th or, or three people being in an elevator that have created decisions and conversations right. that change the course of our company, which yep. don't happen anymore. Right. Yep. And, and they only happen if you're intentional, if you're intentional, then you're being prescriptive about what you want to happen. But many of the things in life are about things that happen when you're not prescriptive. And many of the best inventions, penicillin on, right, happen not through intention, but through happenstance and serendipity. So you, you, that, a lot of that's been removed. And I think that coming back is huge. Um, you know, brand, there's a brand opportunity really um, leading to struggles and really um, helping people. I think that one thing that many people, and we've talked about this, have really struggled with, obviously, is mental health. And, you know, there's been a huge boom of mental health apps and meditation apps and things that kind of have helped people. And I think it's something that companies can also do as well mm -hmm. um, to help people um, get through this. And again, flexibility is so huge. I think flexibility is something that sounds great and is incredibly hard to execute. The implementation is everything. And I think it's, certain companies are more predisposed to be able to offer it. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what everyone wants. And that autonomy, you know, humans don't like to be told what to do all the time. Yeah. So, but you're right. Yeah. It's the implementation that's, that's difficult. I can imagine having an office. There's seven people in the meeting, five people are there. The other two, it's like, is, is, is Joel and John coming in today? Oh, I don't know. I think they're coming in. Oh, let's check the Zoom. Oh, we don't. I mean, there's just yeah. a lot of things I think that need to be thought through um, yeah. with that. And I I just think it's it's hard to look somebody in the eyes, honestly, and say, if you're not here, your, your upward mobility is going to be the same as somebody who is here every day. I just yeah. think it's like, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, what you see in front of you, the, the term is escaping me right now. Um, but like the, what you see in front of you is what you know. And if you're seeing people every single day and they're working yeah. hard and there's somebody working just as hard remotely, I just think we're going to gravitate because we're going to trust the people who we see every single day. Um, yeah. So. I, so some thoughts on that are if you are going to implement a good hybrid or remote culture, then you need to very oh, out of sight, out of mind. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, and I was thinking perception is reality. Like yeah. the perception that you're not here is means you're not here. But if you are going to implement a remote or hybrid structure, then you need extremely clear um, benchmarks and goals or KPIs for every single position. So you at the very least can, without, you know, introducing too much subjectivity objectively, how is this person performing? Yeah. If that is the bedrock of the system of evaluating someone's performance. And I think there can be success, but as a human, I agree with you. Like I like to work with my teams in person, uh, yeah. and do it as much as possible. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, so, and, and, and obviously the industry is going to be a big 
question. You know, we've seen big banks like uh, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs come out yeah. and say, you know, Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan famously said, you know, I'm sick of Zoom. I never want to do a yeah. Zoom again after this. Um, so a lot of the big banks. But then, you know, you told me, Colin, the other day that many banks um, are, are, sa are not saying that. You'd be yeah. asking other banks aren't saying that. But I think that financial institutions, uh, you know, I believe that if you wore a suit and tie to work before the pandemic, you're more likely to have to come in the office after it. Or if you wore a t-shirt and jeans, maybe yeah. not. Um, you know, you have companies like Slack that basically say you can work remotely. And I think well, you know, it, it makes sense for them given- Slack is eating their own dog food on that one, right? They're, yeah, they're 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 definitely benefited by that. They almost have to. Yep. Um, people are definitely excited to see and be seen. We did a huge event um, where we brought all of our employees together for something called the Sue's Cruise, which was amazing. Um, where you know, when the pandemic hit, we had 50 employees, now we have 160. And wow. so, and so basically three quarters of the company had never seen anyone right. else in the company. And we brought everybody together. We did a kind of town hall vision of the future, and then we we had this boat that took us out in New York Harbor and you just feel so much closer with everyone after that. So I think, and that's something that we're going to invest every quarter to bring people together because until we have a functioning office, because it's so incredibly um, important. Um, this is interesting, but over half of people are excited to return the pre-pandemic dressing and grooming. And I think a lot of people are sort of tired of, of sweats and t-shirts um, yeah. and people want to look and feel their best again. Um, yeah. And a big part of work is, is kind of expressing yourself. Um, through style and, and 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 making sure that you're you know taking care of yourself. So many people gain so much weight during the pandemic because all like people saw was their chest up. And I think a lot of people want to feel and look their best selves. And having a work off environment kind of pushes them to do that. Um, so I think that that's you know a lot of people now are, are are saying like we're going back to the office and I haven't been stressed out about our first day outfit. So I was incoming freshman in high school. Yeah, I think it's so true. And I think it's obviously going to be a huge push for um, fragrance companies, apparel companies, um, hair, makeup, beauty, you name it. It's going to be, um, you know, a lot of demand for these companies to the extent that I don't think people realize because a lot of these products, people didn't really need to think about during a pandemic when they're home. Um, all day. Um, in, the, in the beginning, Target uh, released this data on, and by the beginning, I mean like Q3, Q2 of last year, releasing data on all of their tops in clothing skyrocketed in terms of sales, but all their bottoms, all, all the pants and shorts. And things <laughs> that just makes sense. Operated overnight. It's funny. Yeah, absolutely. Um, over half of consumers say they need new clothes the next year than they did yeah. during the pandemic. I mean, many because of weight gain or hopefully for some, you know, they got on their Peloton enough that's because of weight loss right. and they got more fit for whatever reason, people's bodies change over a couple of years and they need to sort of reacquaint. Maybe their styles and tastes have changed um, over time. And it's, it creates an opportunity also for you to reinvent yourself, um, right. you know, in, in, in terms of the way that you present yourself. Um, so bring those back to school uh, feelings for adults is a, is sort of something, a, a cute insight that our team has kind of come up with where you remember going back, uh, you know, High school after the summer, your freshman or sophomore year, and what you wore that first day um, was so important. Well, in a lot of ways, that people are going to be feeling that when they go back in the office uh, uh, for the first time. Um, this stat says nine in ten shoppers plan to revamp their wardrobe um, in some way. Uh, Levi said that they got a boost from people's changing waistlines. There you go during the pandemic in terms of uh, getting people um, to basically resize themselves. Um, Forty, nearly forty percent of people miss in-person lunch. Yep. Staying together, which is huge. You know, getting getting out to lunch with somebody, talking to them, getting to know them more personally, again, coming up with ideas. A lot of people are, are looking forward to in-person meetings. I know, um, you know, Colin, you said you guys had an, uh, an off-site recently. How off, often do you guys get together with your team at Cody? Well, we, we're fully remote, but, you know, one of the hallmarks of Cody is that we have Cody's everywhere. So when I have, uh, I have a handful of colleagues local in the Bay Area we will pick a Cody in San Francisco one week and then maybe the next week we'll meet up in Palo Alto so I can actually just walk to the Cody. And then when I'm in New York City, I'll meet up with my friends there who are in Cody. So the answer to how often, um, I would say about once a week for myself and depending on the other person's situation, like we have one guy who has two kids and he just hasn't been able to make it work with dropping them off and picking them up from school. Right. So that, but that's the flexibility aspect. We both have the same access to space. He chooses yeah. to use it less than I do. Right. And and what's the difference in the output of those meetings when you see people in person, in your opinion? That's a great question. I don't necessarily think I get more done um, of my typical work. But then to your point, serendipity happens. We talk about adjacent topics that we yeah. wouldn't as well because 
you set up a Zoom or a Google Hangout meeting and there's a topic, you stick to it. You don't have 10 minutes at the end where you just kind of casually talk about either their personal lives or other things ancillary to the, the primary topic. And so I think that's where the gold of in-person meeting is. That once again, serendipity, water cooler talk and moving outside of the main topic. Yeah. I also feel that I just have a little bit more intuition in yeah. people's emotions and their intentions. Absolutely. When I see them in person, like, yeah. are you unhappy? Are you really behind this? Is there something that you're not saying? It's so much more right. easy to interrupt somebody over zoom when you're not even trying to do it. I mean, yeah. there's just so many things. And I think when you can sense people's intuitions um, or your intuition and their intentions, you're able to act on those and get to a yeah. more productive output. And that's, we're, something. yeah, we're not designed to speak, you know, what two feet away from someone, or in this case, a screen all day for 10 to 14 yep. hours a day. Yep. And it's, we, there, there've been a number of studies just in the last six months showing that like it is, it's a stress on the body. It oh creates this confrontational aspect. Cause like as humans, we're supposed to have some space. We're supposed to be moving and just sitting like this is, is terribly unhealthy. I, I try to move around my house as much as possible during the day, but well, yeah, I just walk outside and I yeah. basically, my calls go longer and they're more productive when I'm outside than over zoom. When I'm on yeah. zoom, um, not a webinar, say the consumer webinar, but when I'm having a Zoom call with my team, like there's almost a like ticking clock in my head waiting for it to end. And yeah. when I'm walking outside and I'm having a conversation, I don't. The clock doesn't exist. You're talking about flow state, and it's hard yeah. to get flow state flow when state. you're not even flowing. That's a very San Francisco term. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fair. Uh, yeah, but you're 100% right. And now yeah. I might adopt it and I'm going to get, I think me and you are in a nice flow state right now. So, um, as so, long as we can get over. Zoom. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, um, in person might look different. Um, obviously, conferences are a big thing. Um, I believe that we need to get in front of our customers as a company. Um, oh, we're talking about a bunch of different events for the fall and into next year for customer events. I think conferences, I actually agree with this headline from Wired, conferences will be shorter and smarter. Um, I think they're going to be more intimate. I think the days of 125,000 people at CES, like I just question the productivity of that anyway. I mean, yep. from a sales standpoint and our ability to go to market, we are we have been more productive. I mean, the amount of customers okay. we can talk to, the amount of people we can see, et cetera. And when you're selling a software tool, ultimately they're buying the tool and yep. yes, the people matter. Our customer success team matters, but it's not like you're an a, a services business. So I think right. all, it goes back to the business model where if you're selling a software tool and the software tool is great, then Zoom might be enough where if you're building a deep relationships and you're somebody's consulting firm, maybe you do need right. to get in front of them or you're their banker, et cetera. So yeah. what are your thoughts on conferences though? I've, I've mixed, well, I'll, I'll focus on the in-person because what you said about like, we like to do, we like to sell in person, but you're getting more deals done right now, maybe because yeah. it's mass. We know venture capitalists are doing more pitch meetings than ever before. Absolutely. And, and we know that they're giving out more money. So at least in that industry, it's maybe been better or it's better than for volume. But for sales, I'm, I'm a head of growth. I work with all of our enterprise customers at Cody, and I've been doing this for about 10 years. I try to see as many of our future clients in person as possible. Yeah. And I've actually been trending data now across five of the companies I've worked at. And the companies I visit in person have a much higher chance of transacting with me if I if I visit that's, them. That's kind of always been the case, right? I mean, you build the I believe it, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, and, and then so, take that to an employee environment and you know, employees will have a much higher chance, I believe, of wanting to collaborate with you if they met you in person. So it's very similar in terms of um, yeah. how that works out. Um, so let's talk about back to school because that's obviously a big issue. Uh, parental emotions are a mixed bag. Um, you know, 47% of parents are feeling happy. 38% are feeling excited. You know, I have two kids that are in overnight camp, uh, right now. Um, they all got all the, both of my kids are vaccinated. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that or not, but like they are, um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're both teenagers and they're, and they're both in high school and, um, they go to a summer camp and, you know, they got, they all had to get tested before they went to summer camp and everyone was negative, but then they retest everyone. They got the camp and one younger kid was positive and then they had to lock it down for 10 days, not lock it down, but you know, masked a lot of protocols. And then um, they retested everybody and it, everybody was negative and they did this huge sort of like event announcement. It was emotional watching it because all the kids threw their masks in the air and it's like, they're free. Right. And they were able to like be, um, a camper the way that they remembered it, the way that I remembered it. And it's like, I just yeah. think kids deserve that at camp and they deserve that at school. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm excited. I'm also cautiously optimistic because you just really don't know. Yeah. Um, and there are politics that are involved in all these things, but, you know, I think parents definitely have a range of emotions. And, you know, if, if I had a kid that wasn't vaccinated, I probably would be a little fearful too. Like, you know, yeah. 
So I think that you don't really know and in terms of what it's going to be like. But I just think that kids more than anybody need that in-person interaction and they need that. So I don't know if you had thoughts on that on back to school and what I, that means. So I'm, I'm not a parent. Um, I foster kittens once in a while with my fiance. But Are your kittens going to go back in person? Um, <laughs> they're very eager for it. Work from home has been tough for them. But yeah, I'm sure. The, for, for kids, and I, I know California is at least mandating uh, a continued mask mandate, uh, I'm very concerned about that. And I'll leave the COVID discussion aside. I'm just worried about children's development. When yeah, it's three, four, exactly. five, seven, ten-year-olds, you don't, like, once again, human, adults, we need to be able to see someone's face, their mouth. How And you mentioned how you like to have meetings in person because you can work off the person's energy, the way they're they're articulating with their body. Kids are even more so. They're they they mime what their parents do, and they do that with their faces. So covering, you know, sixty percent of it in the most important parts is scary to me. Yep. And what for me, and this goes on both sides of the of the aisle, but like the politicization of of COVID obviously is just something that's terrible in my opinion, and even more so when it comes to decisions about kids in school, because that's sort of like their innocence. And right. you know, I do think that you know there is politics to enter these decisions on both sides. Absolutely. Um, and you don't really know if the decisions are being made on what's really best for the kids versus somebody's up for reelection or somebody, somebody's trying to make a political statement. It's just, yeah. it, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, it's just hard to see because ultimately you're playing with the kids. Like they're the chess pieces and these are yeah. young developing minds and emotions that are trying to grow in such a critical phase of their life. Totally agreed. Um, so, uh, parents are obviously most excited for more free time, the ability to focus more. Again, I think yeah. working from home, if you're a parent, you had to, but when your kids go to school, you might be bored home alone all day. You, or might you, can, escape, you can go somewhere else. Yeah. One, um, one thing I add to that last slide is, and I, I speak to a lot of parents who are in positions like you all the time. They're excited for more internet bandwidth. When you have kids at home doing zoom conference calls. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you have 100 megabytes. If you have three kids, and maybe I, I spoke to a woman the other day, her three kids and her husband were on the on Zoom calls all at the same time. She couldn't turn on her camera. Otherwise, yeah. it would lock the screen. The, the key is hardwiring. I have hardwired. Hard hard okay, yeah. I don't use Wi-Fi. I just plug in, and I never have issues. So. You have opinions on Wi-Fi, or is it just for speed? Um, well, in terms of what? In terms of oh, like, are you are you worried about like just Wi-Fi in your house all the time, or do you just are you just focused? No, on no, I just want. I, yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. I just don't want to lose connection during a great webinar like this. So I'm thinking of um, a third, over a third of parents are feeling anxious, obviously, about their uh, kids going back to school. Obviously, the COVID protocols are just still out there. I think it's obviously, you know, kids 12 and under are the one area that has been vaccinated. So for younger kids, obviously, this is where, gonna, where the sort of issues are going to be focused. Um, heading yeah. into the fall. Um, and that's where a lot of the um, kind of, you know, ambiguity is going to come. And a lot of the controversy and a lot of the concerns are going to come with young kids in school. And it's yep. going to be interesting um, to see what happens. And, you know, as we mentioned, plans are, are, are fragmented. Um, you know, CDC says vaccinated teachers and students don't need, no, don't need masks. But then, as you mentioned, calling California is requiring masks at school. So um, that you know, that's, it's just hard to understand. I've, I have a lot of family members in California and they have mixed emotion about this, obviously, because yeah. you know, they don't want their kids wearing masks anymore. I, I do think one of the fallouts from this decision in California and just generally across the United States, I would love if anyone listening has data on this, but the increase in homeschooling and, and unschooling and other options for kids, not in public schools. Of course, that puts a tremendous strain on the parents who often have to lift some of the academic burden as in teaching, or it's more expensive. But my guess is these sorts of decisions will drive people away from public schools. Yeah. Yeah. To those who actually have that ability. You can't, which, yeah. you know, in the, the networks I'm in, and I'm right in the heart of Palo Alto, which is a weird microcosm. I, I was speaking to your team beforehand for the first time in history, the, the average home price here is above 2 million. Right in this county, which is just, it's just crazy. So uh, kind of separating yourself from that community is, is very difficult because it is very much a, yeah. a little world. It sure is. Um, people are um, buying more for back to school than ever before. Yep. Again, like the retail craze. And, you know, one of the things we've talked about this during other state of the consumer webinars, I think one huge misconception is that 
e-commerce growth will somehow end when people can go into stores. But if you talk to any parent who's buying all this stuff for back to school and you ask them where they're getting it from, they're going to say Amazon, right? Or they're going to say another e-commerce platform. So I think e-commerce and just the huge momentum it's seen since the pandemic, I think it's really just getting started um, for so many new categories, whether it be liquor or groceries, et cetera, that that consumers have adopted during the pandemic. Um, You know, one opportunity, obviously, um, is to help parents uh, prepare uh, for the uncertainty in terms of um, how it works. So I think it's that's just content has always been sort of a, such a big opportunity um, for businesses really to help um, you know consumers navigate through uncertainty, and and now is no different. So in conclusion, um, schools and offices are opening in the fall. Um, you know that we don't really know what it means. Um, we do know it's not going to go back to a 2019 state. You know, we knew there's going to be a lot of ambiguity. Um, and, you know, the one thing is certain people um, are going to pay for the freedom, either employers paying for the freedom of their employees, employees maybe missing out on things for being remote. And there's going to be just a lot of sacrifices and decisions that have to be made um, after it. And um, obviously brands can continue, as we mentioned, to ex- can continue to expect acceleration across retail, entertainment, food, so many different categories. So um, I'd love to bring in uh, my esteemed colleague, Abel Flint now, um, so we can go over um, some questions from today. But this was great, uh, Colin. I had a lot of fun and uh, looking forward to seeing what uh, our audience has for us. Abel, you're on mute or, or you're not on mute, but we can't really hear you. Still can't hear you. <laughs> Fortunately, we ha- I have some of the questions in the Q&A chat. Abel, I can always read them here. He'll, well. he'll be on in a second, but you want to uh, – You no, we can't hear you, but um, Colin, why don't you get started, and then I'm sure we'll hear Abel in a second. Yeah, so I'm just kind of looking at some of these Q&As. Um, Kara asked, looking for any insight on how back-to-normal will affect back-to-school shopping dynamics. Well, we just that was asked at the very beginning of the hour, but we were just kind of touching on it. I mean, according to the data just presented and from what – I'm seeing and from talking to parents, I think I think everyone's kind of excited to improve their wardrobe, improve their trapper keeper. And I'm probably aging myself by talking about that. I, like, I love trapper keepers. Oh, yeah. And like I, I wish I think Jansport has made a comeback since I was rocking it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I would guess that all these brands are going to improve. And, you know, Levi's uh, is seeing huge demand, um, you know, partly because of weight gain during the pandemic, but also because people just want new clothes. Um, yeah. So. I would guess that a lot of those markets are going to improve. Yeah. I mean, you have savings rates at an all time high. Right. You have people that have not been able to spend money uh, in, the, in the past year on travel. Um, yeah. People have not been making luxury purchases. Uh, you know, That's home cool. buying and investment in the home has been obviously a huge, um, yeah. you know, spending. But I think in terms of some of that discretionary, um, smaller item, um, lower involvement category spending, it hasn't really been there. And I think it's going to come back with yeah. engines. I, I agree with you there. And one of the questions I have is like, so we're in this, I, I call it irrationally exuberant because there's so much money floating around and a lot of it's being debased in value because of inflation. Yeah. Wonder And where did some of this money come from? Like one, people were probably getting paid the same if they were, especially knowledge stimulus checks. Yes. Stimulus checks a hundred percent. And then also people weren't spending that money, for example, in restaurants. Yep. Uh, the sad thing is that's not hurting one big public company. The big public restaurant companies are actually doing fine. It hurt all of the small local sure businesses. So one thing that I encourage everyone to do, and I'm sure most people are eager to do, is like go out and spend at local restaurants because yep. those and Amazon buy local are, stores and you know exactly. Bezos already has enough money, right? That's kind of the, that's sort yep. of the thing. So yeah, I agree. Um, but then again, people want convenience, and right now right. consumers, the one thing they're going to have less of is time, and the best right. way to save time is buying things online. So kind of like shopping locally sometimes can fly in the face of that. So that's sort of the you know that's the paradox there. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm going to type a poll. I'm curious how many people bought groceries online for the first time during the pandemic. Yeah. I, I know I did. Um, and the question is, will the people who started buying, buying groceries online ever go back to in person? So they'll keep purchasing from Whole Foods owned by Amazon and get it delivered. But will they go back to their local re- you know, grocer? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that once you get used to the convenience of buying something online, it is just hard to go back. I think people have misconceptions about buying um, groceries online through Instacart or what have you. But once you feel like you you your first order is successful and the and the produce is fine, you're like, eh, I'm just going to do that next time. And people are creatures of habit, and it's so easy to get in those types of habits. Yeah. The easier a habit is to conduct, the easier it is for it to become something that gets ingrained. 
and shopping online is very easy, which is why it's an easy habit that sticks yeah. to people. Uh, there's a question here. Yes, Rachel has said, yes, agencies will want to meet your customers, but companies are going to have rules in place around visitors. And that's definitely true. We have heard from some um, of our customers saying that we're not allowing visitors anymore. Um, you know, visitors are not really allowed at our company. We don't know when they can. So in some businesses, even if you want to visit your customers, you're not able to. Um, because companies are just a, a little bit skittish about having, um, you know, about having guests, uh, I'm going to answer your poll, um, at their office, which is, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, let's see what other Q and A. Yeah. Here. Uh, here's one. You mentioned 38% of consumers are looking forward to having in-person lunch. We also parents especially enjoyed family time and cooking at home. How will cooking at home transform? So I believe, my belief is that you look at three ways people eat, right? They eat at restaurants, they order in, or they cook at home. I think obviously with things changing and certain things like restaurant use growing, it's got to come at the cost of something. I think with, with eating specifically, it's going to come at the cost of ordering in. And I think the door dashes of the world yep. have, have done so well. I think it's going to be more challenging for them because people are either going to want to continue to cook at home because it's healthier and they like being with their family, or they're going to want that connection of being at restaurants where it's sort of like ordering in is neither here nor there. So I think with all these things, it's like, as you think about consumers embracing more of one thing, because they only have so much money, only so many hours a day, it's got to come at the cost of something else. So yeah. every new trend that's coming up is going to come at the cost of a prior trend that maybe happened. Yeah. And kind of getting to the point of like going out, being more intentional about when you spend time with people and doing it outside of a screen. And to me, that's in terms of the, uh, the case of eating, doing that in person, either in your home or at a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Um, well, I think that is it for the questions today. Um, I think we have a poll data if you want. What was uh, that? The, the data has already come through on the poll. Oh, wow. So, oh, yeah. Tell us about that. We had 50 responses so far. And 52% of people said, yes, I bought online groceries for the first time during the pandemic. Wow. And that's increasing as we as I speak. And then 12, 23% uh, of people said, I, I have never bought groceries online. And then 25% said, I bought online groceries before. So over 75% of the people that responded from, from Susie are buying groceries online. And 50% of them did it for the first time during the pandemic. So just right there, we're seeing another industry being disrupted, which is it's moving online and it's probably hurting local business. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So I think that's that trend <laughs> is repeating itself over and over so, and over again. I think, anyways. I think we've determined today, now is not the time to start a local business maybe, which is very right. sad. If that's right. the truth, right. but. Absolutely. Well, awesome. Well, Colin, I just want to thank you for uh, joining today. It was really great. Yeah, I, I told you the hour would fly by fast and it definitely did. And you, you clearly have a lot of lot to say and, and really have thought a lot about this topic given your role at Cody. So uh, we're really thankful to have had you today. And I want to thank everyone who still continues to join us for our State of the Consumer webinars. We are rethinking what it means to have a webinar as a company as we head back into the fall ourselves. So um, we are you know, kind of listening to um, our customers and, and the audience. If you guys have any ideas on how you'd like to see this webinar series evolve moving forward, please do let us know. Um, I want to thank our great team at Suzy for putting all this work together um, and our colleagues on the marketing team for executing this. So on behalf of myself and Colin from Cody, I want to thank um, everyone. I hope you guys are really enjoying your summer um, and looking forward uh, to seeing you next time on State of the Consumer Webinar. So take care, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Everyone. Bye -bye. See ya.